Thank you guys so much. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah and chapter number two, the book of Jonah and chapter number two. We have made our way uh, through the first chapter in Jonah in a couple of weeks, and we're going to try to cover an entire chapter tonight in one setting, and I don't think it'll be that difficult, but we are entering into our third part of this series, Pride and Prejudice, as we look at Jonah chapter two, the belly of discipline and the prayer of faith, the belly of discipline and the prayer of faith. As we've made our way through Jonah chapter 1, if this is your first night with us or maybe you just uh, maybe don't remember all the details, let me kind of refresh you as to what we've seen to this point. First of all, we saw that Jonah was the boy of promise, wasn't he? We believe that Jonah was the widow of Zarephath's uh, son and therefore he was the widow who was raised from the dead by the prophet Elijah and as such... God must have had a plan for Jonah's life very early on from the beginning of time itself. We saw that he was this boy of promise and in many ways he held the world in the palm of his hands. God had set him up for success. We said that that, uh, he, if anybody ever, was created with a road map to success, with a road map to being faithful, it was surely Jonah whose name itself meant son of my faithfulness. It was supposed to be a testimony about how Jonah was supposed to be faithful to the Lord all of the days of his life. But what we discovered in the first part of chapter 1 is that despite his great beginning, even the stars sometimes fall. Just because you have the right beginning in life, just because you have the right mama and daddy and all those things, doesn't mean that you're not prone to fall. doesn't mean you're not prone to mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Jonah was made to go somewhere. God called him to go everywhere. But what we saw in Jonah chapter 1 was Jonah's pride was going to take him nowhere. Last week, then we looked at Jonah as the lot was cast, and we saw how Jonah was a man worn out, tired, fleeing from the Lord, and wanted to just die. And and so the people gathered together to try to decide what to do, and they cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. And so Jonah says, just hurl me on down into the sea. And he believed in that moment that that maybe in his death would appease God's anger, and the mariners would be saved. Now, while it would have been simple in that moment for the mariners to do so, while it would have been simple for Jonah just to jump overboard, <clears throat> the process itself is not simple, right? We know the story of Jonah well, and we kind of just brush over it sometimes, but we talked last week about how much planning must have had to go into place in order for this fish to be appointed by the Lord, the writer says, to come and to swallow him and for Jonah to live in him for three days and three nights. It would have been simpler in simple terms. It would have been simpler if God would have just said, you know what, this guy's not doing what I want him to do. There's no way to get him to do what I want to do, so I'm just going to let him go on his own way. If he chooses to die, that's his own business. I'm just going to move on. I'm going to give his job to somebody else. And yet that's not what we saw in God. In fact, the first grace we're really seeing in the story of Jonah isn't about the Ninevites. It's about Jonah himself. Jonah needed God's grace. And so God lavished it upon him. He poured him out on him in a a strange way. He sent a fish to come and to swallow him. You see, in the divine counsel of God's will, God had for many years worked this plan, preparing Jonah to be swallowed up, to be disciplined. God loved Jonah enough not to let him go. So we concluded last Sunday night by saying that the greatest lesson we can learn from Jonah chapter 1 is that God loves us very much. God loves us so much that he's not going to let us just go off on our own way. He's not going to let us uh, live off in our sin. He's, he loves us so much, he's going to discipline us, restore us. He's going to do whatever is necessary to sanctify us, to make us into the image of his son. Now tonight what I want to do is I want to turn our attention to what happened to Jonah after he'd been cast into the sea and swallowed up by that great fish. This is a part of the story I wish we knew more about. You know what I'm saying? You ever feel like you watch a movie and you get to the end of it and you're like, man, they, they skipped over the best parts. They, they spent an hour building up the problem and then they spent another half hour telling us about the solution. But everything in the middle, that was the good stuff, right? I, I don't know, maybe your mind doesn't work that way, but that's the way mine works. And I, I read the story of Jonah and I'm like, Jonah, what was it like to live down in a fish for three days and three nights? Was it disgusting, you know? I mean, you kind of get a glimpse of it because he says there was weeds wrapped around my head. I mean, that, that must have been a sight, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I guess not. But I, I think it must have been a, quite a story to tell having lived in a fish for three days and three nights. 
I think he must have known some things about the fish's digestive tract, as it were, that you and I, well, maybe you don't want to know, but I'd like to know about it. I'd like to know more information. But instead, the writer doesn't really tell us much about it. He just simply tells us that Jonah was cast overboard, and then all of a sudden a fish swallowed him up, and then we go right into chapter 2, where Jonah is praying, and God is going to answer. Now, before you look at the prayer itself in Jonah 2, let me stop for a moment. The prayer is remarkable, and we're going to look at it verse by verse. But again, because my mind works in weird ways, the second question I had was not only what did you go through, but Jonah, how long did it take? While you were sitting there in the belly of that fish, how long did it take for you to finally get to a place where you were willing to pray to God? Remember, it was Jonah who had decided that he would rather die than confess his sin. So it must have probably taken him a little bit, don't you think? I mean, surely if the sea didn't disturb him, if the waves didn't disturb him, if he was willing to be hurled into the, to sea, uh, uh, into the sea rather than confess his sin, I'm thinking that a little fish swallowing him probably didn't do anything to him either. I'm thinking when he got swallowed by that fish, he probably just sat in there and he thought, well, sooner or later I'm going to die. I might as well just suffer through it, right? In fact, actually the writer does give us some answer to that question. In verse number 10 of chapter 2, we're told that Jonah had prayed the prayer, but then it says, and the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Now, the text does not explicitly state that this was immediate. In other words, it doesn't explicitly state that Jonah prayed, and immediately God said, hey, fish, I want you to throw him up and throw him out there. But it seems to imply that as soon as Jonah prayed, there was this immediate response on the part of God. In other words, the moment Jonah said, God, I need your grace, all of a sudden God said, here it is, spoke to the fish, and the fish threw him up. Well, if that's the case, then verse 17 of chapter 1 tells us how long it took Jonah. Because verse number 17 of Jonah 1 says, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. In other words, tonight, beloved, it's fairly reasonable to assume that Jonah was in the fish almost a full three days before he decided that he was going to pray and ask God to save him. Now that is the very definition of pride. That's, that's how you know you have really gotten your mind corrupt. That's how you know that you have really come to a place in your life where you can't hear any truth, where you can't even listen to what other people have to say. That's how you know that you are totally corrupted by pride. I'm thinking if it was me, that the wind and the waves would have probably rocked my boat. I think that, that in itself would have said, you know what, maybe I've made a bad decision, I'll go a different direction. But if not, I'm thinking when the, mar the mariners threw me overboard, I'm thinking that might have got my attention. If not, I'm thinking when the fish jumped out of the water and gulped me up, that would have got my attention. But apparently, Jonah was so full of pride that he sat in the belly of the fish for three days thinking about what his next move should be, right? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, maybe, maybe you uh, are too stuck on the flanograph. You remember the picture of Jonah sitting down there in the fish with his little Bic lighter, you know, trying to kind of camp out, make the best of the situation. No, nobody else? Okay, all right. I mean, I, I'm thinking you, you got to be really corrupt. you got to be really corrupt in your thinking to take three days to decide, hey, maybe I should just go ahead and talk to God about this matter. But it goes to show us the level of Jonah's pride and prejudice. It goes to show us just how deeply Jonah was scarred, just how deeply Jonah was angry, just how deeply Jonah was prejudicial towards the Ninevites. It goes to show us just how much Jonah had decided that he was going to live life on his terms. You see, the reason I bring it up is it goes to show the level of pride and prejudice that was in Jonah's heart. The story of Jonah is all about God's grace. But make no mistake about it, beloved. The grace being displayed is great toward the servant of the Lord, is as great toward the servant of the Lord as it is the evil Ninevites and the pagan mariners. The story of God's grace isn't just about those heathen, evil Ninevites. It's about God's grace toward his servant. I used this, not used this this morning, but I thought of this this morning as our young adults class is going through the Gospel of Luke, and in chapter 2, we see the announcement of the coming of Christ, and we see in that announcement the both ends of the spectrum. There's the evil offenders, the shepherds, who are announced that the Christ has come, 
And then on the other side, there's a prophet, and there's a man by the name of Simeon, and, 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 and God announces to these religious people also the coming of Christ. And Luke, what he does in that moment is he shows us that Jesus Christ came for both ends of the spectrum, and everybody in between, God's grace needed to be poured out on the most vile offender, and it needed to be poured out on the most worthy moralist needed to be poured out on the most religious right-wing nut, and it needed to be poured out on the heathen. Jonah was about to see that in his story. That's what his story's about. God's grace isn't just for Nineveh, not just for the vile offender. It's for everybody, and even sometimes the servants of the Lord, not sometimes, all the time, the servants of the Lord need God's grace as much as anybody else. For me, it becomes a story about several things then in that moment. First of all, it's a story about blind spots to this point. Jonah had a blind spot in his life. He was a servant of the Lord, no doubt about it. But, what, uh, but that did not make him perfect. And that's what we're seeing, that he had a blind spot in his life towards his attitude. Second of all, even with our blind spots, we're still useful to God. God wasn't going to cast out Jonah simply because he was stubborn. God had a purpose, and like it or not, Jonah was going to fulfill that purpose. Third, the story to this point shows us that no matter how full of pride we might be, no matter how dark the darkness of our heart, God is in the redeeming business. He wasn't going to let nobody get away. There is no depth, no height no, to which that God was unwilling to reach to redeem his people. And that's the story of Jonah to this point. That being said tonight, let's look at the prayer of Jonah into two parts. First of all, I want you to listen to the words themselves. In verse number two, Jonah says, I called out to the Lord. Out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Jonah, in that moment, in that simple verse, he affirms the unfathomable depth of God's mercy. Did you know that you cannot reach the end of God's mercy tonight? You can't reach the end of his reach. You can't reach the end of how far he's willing to go to give grace. In fact, Jonah's going to affirm this later on in chapter number 4. He, after he preaches to the Ninevites and they get saved, Jonah turns to, to God in verse 2 of chapter 4 and he says, And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew you were a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger. Now that's something to be angry at God about, right? Jonah says, I knew it. I knew it all along. You've always been a God of grace. You've always been a God of mercy. In verse number 2 of this prayer, what Jonah does is he speaks about the unfathomable richness, the unfathomable depth of God's grace. You cannot tap that well dry tonight. God was never out of reach for the prophet. No matter how dark the darkness of his mind had gotten, no matter how corrupt the sinful nature had been, God was right there. Even though the prophet thought that he was headed for hell itself, even if he might have been in hell, he uses the word sheol, God could hear his voice. He says, God, you heard me in the depth of Sheol. You heard me in the depth of hell itself. But a listening God, beloved, while comforting is not enough. And so Jonah even affirms that God not only heard my prayer, but then he says, you answered my prayer. Even in the depth of my distress, even in the depravity of my distress, e even when I was headed for damnation itself, when I was headed right there, when I was in that pit, God, you heard my prayer and you answered me. See, God did not merely hear the voice of his servant. He answered him. God's mercy, beloved tonight, God's reach is unfathomably deep. There's nothing, no place that you and I could have gone that God cannot reach us right there where we're at. In fact, I would suggest to you in this moment, Jonah's implying that God was right there in the fish with him. He was right there in the depths of the sea. He was right there in the midst of what was going on. Verse number 3, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows, he says, passed over me. Now Jonah was caught up in the sea. Illustratively speaking, he speaks about the waves and the billows and, and even the flood. Anybody who's ever been to the ocean or ever seen the devastating effects of the flood, you kind of have a mental picture probably already forming. As I read those words and started kind of typing out some of my notes, I, I thought about when Kelly and I went to the ocean for the very first time. We were on our honeymoon, and it was at least the first time I'd been ever, ever been to the ocean that I could remember. I think I'd been as a child, but, but I didn't remember that, and I think it was her first time as well. And we were there right in front of a hurricane. Should have been a, a, a telltale sign of what our marriage was going to be like. Amen? 
We got there right in front of a hurricane, and all of a sudden the weather started kicking up. You remember this well? The skies got dark. We wanted to take a cruise, and nobody was brave enough to do it. You know, I don't understand. But anyway, we were down there on the ocean, and we had about two days before the hurricane was going to kick in. By the way, you can get some great rates on hotel in the middle of hurricane season, right? So we're down there, and we're on the ocean, we're on the, 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 the shore, and, and as we're standing there, the, the first day, I had seen signs that said, watch out for the undercurrent, right? Because I, I didn't, never been there, I didn't know what that meant, so we come walking out there, and man, I wasn't much deeper than maybe my knees at the most, and all of a sudden, man, this huge billowing wave comes and just tosses me forward. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, you're a pretty big specimen, so that must have been a big wave. You're right, it was a huge wave, right? Blows me over, and, and, and some of you are just getting that now. It just blows me over, and then all of a sudden, the undercurrent, you know what it started doing? It started pulling me under to a point that I, I thought I was a pretty good swimmer, to a point that I thought to myself, man, this is how it's going to end, right? I'm dead. That's the illustration in my mind. As Jonah says in this moment, your waves and your billows, they overcame me. They crashed in. They were pounding on me on every side. They were drowning me, right? What is notable, however, is that Jonah says, God, you cast me into the deep. Your waves, your billows. In other words, he was saying in this moment, God, I felt like I was drowning, but it wasn't because of the world. I felt like I was drowning not because of my own even sinfulness. I felt like I was drowning not because of the decisions I'd made. But God, I felt like I was drowning because I'd had an encounter with you. You were overwhelming me. You were, you were drowning me in this moment. You were drowning me with your billows and your waves and the sea itself. You see, it was God who was overwhelming the prophet in this moment. Not the waves, not the waves themselves. Jonah could have survived the sea, even if it had taken his life, he knows he could have survived. The source of his distress in this moment was not the wind or the waves or the sea, not even the billows or the waves themselves. The source of his distress was, he said, God, you're overwhelming. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but been a time or two in my life where I really felt like God was trying to discipline me, trying to chasten me trying to make something new out of me. And sometimes I thought, man, I wish you'd just quit. Seems like a little bit much. Seems like you're kind of going a little overboard. Let's work on this a little bit at a time. That's verse number three. Verse number four. Then I said, I am driven away from your side. And then he says, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. It was God who had sent the waves. It was God who had driven him away from his presence. And Jonah had originally wanted to get away from the presence of the Lord. You'll notice back in chapter 1, Jonah didn't say, I, I want to go to Tarshish to get away from the Ninevites. He said, I want to get away from the presence of the Lord. The mariner said, you are fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Jonah had wanted to get as far away from God as possible. But when he had done that, guess what happened? All of a sudden now, in verse number 4, he's saying, I'd kind of like to get back. I wanted to get as far away from you as possible, God. But, but listen, one day I'm going to look upon your holy temple again. I'm going to see you. That, that, that phrase, holy temple, you should know what it means. In the Jewish theology, the temple was the place where the very presence of God dwelt. It was the place where he inhabited. It was the place where his grace and his mercy was found there on the altar of sacrifice. So Jonah was saying in this moment, hey, I wanted to get away from the presence of God, but when I finally did, suddenly I desire to go back. Suddenly I desire to get back into his presence. Suddenly I want to be right back there with him. See, Jonah, the prophet, he learned a valuable lesson. Out of the darkest depths of the sea, what Jonah found out was that the only light was the presence of the Lord. Verse 5 and 6, the waters closed in over me to, to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head as the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. There could be no mistake about it. Jonah had seen the depths of the earth. The sea was as deep, he says, as the roots of the mountains. Vivid imagery there if you'll stop and think about it. How deep do the roots of a tree go? Well, depending on what brand of tree it is, they can go pretty deep. In fact, I, I remember when they were just preparing the ground out here for, 
for this new building as they were out there with the excavator and digging up trees. I remember sitting out there and watching them work on one particular tree and it took them like three hours to get that thing dug out because the roots were almost 10 foot deep. Jonah says, when I got down in the bottom of the sea, I was so low on the face of the earth. I was so low that it was as though I was looking at the roots of the mountains. That's how low I was. He had known the prison of a fish's ribcage, he says, known the bars. His life was over, save God did something miraculous. And so Jonah says, guess what? He did. You brought up my life, he writes from the pit. Verse 7, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. It took Jonah quite a while. His life was all but over, but it took him quite a while to turn to the Lord. And when Jonah finally did, he says that that moment of death, I remembered the Lord. I want you to stop and think about that phrase for a moment. He's just in vivid imagery described the depths of his condition. The darkness of his heart, the, the place where he was. And, and while it's a physical place, that the, 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 the fish is swimming in the sea as deep as it can. While it's a very physical place, it's imagery of how far Jonah said he felt like he was away from the presence of God. Heaven help us. Ever felt like that? I'm not even saying that it was necessarily the result of sin. Sometimes we get in the midst of the messiness of life, as we talked about this morning, where we look around and we say, where's God in all this? God can't possibly be anywhere near in this moment. He's got to be a long, long ways off. Jonah says, that's how far I was. I felt like I was as far as humanly possible away from God. And then he says, all of a sudden, I remember the Lord. In the depths of that moment, in the darkness of that moment, Jonah, it's like a light clicked on in his head. And he said, oh yeah, there was one that I could call upon. By the way, I use this as an illustration this morning. It's quite the opposite of a figure we see in history by the name of Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin was a Marxist not only in practice like you might see in, say, uh, the, pres the uh, president leader in Russia, but what he was was he was a Marxist in philosophy. In other words, he believed that he was the Jesus of Marxism. He believed that he could literally make the world a better place by following Marxism and inundating and indoctrinating his people, even if they were unwilling to, to do that, to kill them off. Because the world would be a better place if you had these types of individuals, these Marxists in the world. He was afraid of religion. He was afraid of the effects of religion. He was afraid of what the belief in God would mean to Marxism and what it would mean to a class system and what it would mean to a social system that he was trying to establish. And so he banned all religion, he banned Christianity, he persecuted anybody who would preach that God existed. He spent his entire life, as it were, trying to prove to people that God did not exist and when they refused to believe him, he would just kill them off hoping that a new breed, a new generation would come along and they wouldn't remember the things that others had spoken about. They wouldn't know that a God existed. His daughter tells the story of his death. There in the darkest of moments, in the darkness, the stillness of a day, when Joseph Stalin realized maybe for the first time that he was no God, but that he was a mortal man and that his life was coming to its end, his daughter writes that he took his hand and clenched a fist. And he held it up toward heaven and shook it in one final act of defiance against the Lord. Quite the opposite from what we see in the prophet Jer Jonah in this moment. Jonah got into the deepest moment of his life. He got as far away from the presence of God as humanly possible. And in that moment, he thought to himself, man, isn't there somebody? Isn't there a solution? Isn't there a cure? Isn't there somebody who knows how to help me out of this plight? There's a great promise, I think, there and that verse, that in the moment of death itself, when Jonah remembered the Lord, he lifted up a prayer, and listen again, God heard it. Beloved, if you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, I want you to hear this one thing. It does not matter how dark, how deep, how sinful, how corrupt, it does not matter how far you have gone. Listen, there is no place that the mercy, the grace, the reach of God cannot extend to even you tonight. Verse number 8, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. First glance, the verse seems to be a little bit out of place. Jonah wasn't worshiping idols, was he? I mean, he hadn't constructed some 
Baals or Ashtaroth poles. He hadn't constructed any type of gods that we might see in Hindu religion today. And yet Jonah in his prayer says that those who pay regard to vain idols, and I believe the word there that's key is vain, forsake their hope of steadfast love. Jonah is giving us a glimpse into the idol of his heart. That is, that Jonah's idol in this moment was his own self. You see, Jonah had trusted in his own self. Jonah had forsaken the only hope of life when he had decided that he knew better than God what the Ninevites needed and what he needed in his own personal life and ministry. Verse number 9, But I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay, for salvation belongs to the Lord. Interesting, another question I had, third question I had this week as I kind of was preparing and putting my thoughts together was I thought to myself, I wonder what Jonah promised. You ever been in those moments where you're right in the middle of something you know you ought not be and you start saying, man, God, if you just get me out of this, I would, I would sure be grateful. You know? I'll be at church every Sunday morning, won't sleep during half the preacher's sermons, right? I promise to stay awake 50% of the time. None of you ever done that? I did it a lot as a kid. Growing up, I'd do something stupid. I'd do something, uh, I'm not allowed to say stupid. I'd do something silly. I'd do something that I knew that I shouldn't have done, right? And all of a sudden, I'd be laying there in the innocence of my bed, and I'd be going, God, if you just get me out of this, right? If you just get me out of this, I promise, listen, I'll be a better boy tomorrow. I'll, be, I'll listen to mom and dad a little bit more. I'll listen to them a little bit more clearly. I wonder sometimes if my parents had not wiretapped my room. You know what I'm saying? It's like they knew it, right? Sometimes we get that way even in elderly, advanced age, right? We get in the middle of something and we think, man, God, if you just, you just see me through this one, I won't ask for anything else. Jonah, apparently, in the belly of the fish, he made a promise to God. One might presumably assume that he promised to heed the Lord's call on his life. Maybe he said to God, God, if you just get me out of this, I promise I'll go on to Nineveh. Whatever it was, though, he says to God in this moment, God, I'll do it. I made a vow, you'll see me get right to it. Then he declares a great truth. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. It was a great truth on two levels because, first of all, Jonah now realized that he needed the Lord's help. It was as though Jonah was saying in this moment, nobody else could save me. Nobody else could help me. Nobody else could get me out of this terrible plight that I'm in. Only God could do that. But it's also true on a second level, and that is that Jonah had tried to keep salvation from the Ninevites. Jonah had wanted to rule and own salvation. He had wanted to own God's salvation when it came to the Ninevites. He didn't want to go and preach to them because he knew by his own testimony that God was going to save them. But now he was saying in this moment, not only God are you going to save me, but I know that you own salvation. It's yours. I, I've, I've got to do whatever you want me to do. You are the owner of salvation. Now before we move too far away from the words themselves, I want you to notice two things. First of all, repeatedly Jonah calls upon the Lord by his holy name. In your English translations, you will see Lord in all capital letters, not just a capital L and then lowercase o-r-d. You'll see in multiple locations, every time Jonah calls out to the Lord, it says capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's because in the Hebrew, Jonah is calling upon the holy name of God. We find it in verse number 1, verse 2, verse 6, verse 7, and again in verse number 9. Now, why is that significant? Well, it's significant because of what the Jews believed, what Jonah believed. First of all, the Jews believed that the holy name of God should never be pronounced. It should never be proclaimed, for it was too holy for lowly man's lips. And yet, in the midst of his distress, what did Jonah do? He called upon the holy name of God. He was saying in that moment, I, I need something else. I need a higher power. Jonah was desperate. That he would call God by his most holy of names is a testimony that Jonah had run all out of himself. He didn't think there was any way to resolve this conflict except by a supernatural deliverance. Second thing is the Jews also believed that Yahweh, the, the Lord, as it's in your translation, was the creator and sustainer of all things. So in a way, what Jonah was doing was he was calling out for the creator of the universe to save his life. He was saying in this moment, I know that I don't even own my life, 
You are the God who owns my life. You are the God who sustains all things. You are the God who appointed the fish. You are the God who appointed the wind and the waves and the sea. Listen, I need the one true God, the God creator and sustainer of all heaven and earth. That's the God that I need in this moment. So in very simple terms, Jonah needed a personal relationship. This is what his prayer shows us. Are you ready? He needed a personal relationship with the creator and sustainer of the universe of his life was to be spared. This is the proclamation of the gospel. When Jonah called on the holy name of God, he was saying, I need a new, I need a personal, I need a real relationship with the God who created all of this. I need a personal relationship with the God who made the wind, made the seas, made the fish. I need a personal relationship with the God who spoke me into existence. Beloved, nothing has changed. The sad part is that it takes us such distress to come to such moments, to come to those places. C.S. Lewis famously quipped that God whispers to us in our pleasure but shouts to us in our pain. It takes pain in our lives. It takes tribulation. It takes trial. It takes tragedy oftentimes for us to see God in a new way, for us to recognize how desperate we really are for his presence and his power at work in us. Jonah was saying in this moment, man, things are bad. And the only solution is if I could have a personal relationship with the one who's in control of all of this. Second thing I want you to see about his words, what strikes me is something that's often missed, is where, in order to explain it, let me ask a question. Where was Jonah during his prayer? Not a trick question. He was in the belly of the fish, right? He was not delivered from the prison of the fish. He's praying this as he's sitting there in the fish. But I want you to notice a second thing about his words, and that is this. Did you notice that all that he prays is spoken in the past tense? Verse number two, he answered, past tense, me. And you heard, past tense, my voice. Verse six, you brought up, past tense, my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Verse seven, my prayer came, past tense, to you. You say, where are you going with this, preacher? Before Jonah was ever delivered from the fish itself, listen, he was proclaiming his faith in God's mercy. Even before he ever got out of that fish, he said, God, you've already done it. You've already saved me. In other words, Jonah was experiencing a revival long before the fish ever decided to puke him up, you know? Some of you guys need to get with this a little bit tonight. Jonah knew that God's mercy was guaranteed. Now think about this. With man, that's not possible. If you offered a man, you offend a man rather the way Jonah offended God, one might reasonably assume that quite the opposite would happen. One might assume that the mercy is the opposite of what he would receive. Ronald Reagan would say that we trust but verify. We're going to go ahead and say, okay, you're forgiven, but we're going to verify the facts of the case, right? But Jonah, he was confident, listen, he was confident in the mercy of God. That's going to come back later on with the Ninevites, so I'll leave it there for the moment. But Jonah knew something about God. He knew something about the character of God that no matter how far you run, no matter how stubborn your streak, God never, ever gives up. And so he could pray in this moment. He could pray as though he had already received what he needed before it actually happened. Think about that for a moment. He could pray as though it was going, it was a certainty that no doubt about it, God was going to do exactly what was needed, even though it hadn't happened yet. God, Jonah knew in the moment, in this moment, that the time, the moment he turned to God, God would free him from his distress. Perhaps the reason so many live in a state of bondage today led me to this conclusion. Perhaps the reason so many live in a state of bondage today is because they are, and the reason is, is because they're too hesitant. They're so hesitant to turn to God. The reason so many live in a state of bondage today is because they're so hesitant to turn to God. Because God has never changed. God is ready to deliver if only we would but turn and ask. It's probably the greatest message in the book, by the way. God is never far away. His mercy and grace are ever so close. 
having heard his prayer, verse number 10 says, And the Lord spoke to the fish, listen, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. A couple quick thoughts, and I'll be done tonight. I'm almost out of time. First of all, I want you to notice the sense of immediacy. Jonah did not have to sit around, wait and wonder whether or not God had heard his prayer. The moment Jonah prayed, God moved. The moment Jonah said, hey, I'm sorry. The moment Jonah said, I'm desperate for you. The moment Jonah said, I'm tired of running from your presence. I want to be at your holy temple. I want to be in your presence, God. The moment Jonah did that, God moved. He didn't have to sit around and wait and wonder. Second, I want you to notice that God spoke to the fish. The fish was under his command. Let me say something to you tonight, beloved. I don't know your circumstances in a room, congregation this size. There's lots of things going on in lots of people's lives. Listen, let me speak to you very clearly. Just as God was in control of the fish, God's in control of your life tonight. Whatever your distress, whatever your situation, whatever your condition, God's in control of it tonight. Whether it's a storm, a physical condition, an illness, a relationship, a friendship, maybe it's a bankruptcy. Listen, God has them all under his watchful control. In a moment, God can speak and give you deliverance. In a moment. Third, I want you to see that God prepared the right landing spot for Jonah. You you don't think like this, but I like this. The fish just happened to take Jonah, listen to this, to dry land. (laughs) When he vomited him out, and imagine what that vomit must have been like. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the projectile force, no, you don't want to think about that. The moment the fish vomited Jonah out, listen, Jonah landed on dry land. He didn't, I mean, if I was his spouse, I'd have said, Jonah, maybe you better get off in that water there and take a bath before you come any closer, right? But he didn't. As soon as the fish vomited him out, Jonah landed on dry land. You know why he landed on dry land? I got a theory. God didn't want to give him two seconds to stop and think whether he really wanted to go to Nineveh or not. God threw him out on dry land so that the moment he came out of the fish, Jonah immediately started stepping to it. Immediately, Jonah started walking, going right to where he was supposed to go. God, not only, beloved, has your deliverance planned out tonight, he actually knows where he's going to release you. (laughs) God, not only has your your path of deliverance worked out, not only does he know what it's going to take to deliver you, not only does he hear and answer your prayers. Listen, God knows exactly where he's going to make you land when you come out of it. God knows exactly what he's got in store for. Last week, I concluded with a simple truth. God loves you. If God didn't love us, he wouldn't have done all the things that he did for Jonah to get him in the right spot. This week, I want to conclude with another simple truth. It's an easy one. You ready? You don't have to be in the belly of a fish for three days. Make your stay a little bit shorter by simply calling out to him tonight. I don't know your condition, but don't be like Jonah. I was thinking about, have you ever seen those cartoons, Bob? Bob uh, 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 eats vegetables, right? Bob doesn't like meat. Bob is a vegan. Don't be like Bob. Be like Chris, you know? It's almost what the story of Jonah is saying to us tonight. You don't have to be like that. All of us find ourselves from time to time in a terrible place of distress. But we don't have to be like Jonah. Jonah was so full of his pride, so full of his prejudice, that he was unwilling to move. He was unwilling to bend. No matter what God did to him, including throwing a fish at him, nothing was going to move Jonah off of his spot. Nothing was going to move Jonah off of his pride. For three days, Jonah sat there in that fish before finally he said, enough is enough. I'm done. Last night I was playing around in our house with Isaiah. I shouldn't tell you this story. It probably turned me into DFS. But playing around in the house with Isaiah, Isaiah started acting like he was going to beat me up. He's playing a video game right now, so I can talk all about him all I want to, right? He, uh, he, was, gonna, he was acting like he was going to beat me up. You know, he was going to take me out, wrestle me. Now, you may not do that in the preacher's home. That's, that's how we get ready for church on Sunday. Uh, so, we're, 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 you, know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm feeling pretty tough when battling a six-year-old, 46-pound boy, you know. And I said to, I said to Isaiah what, what, I, what my dad would say to me, well, anytime you feel froggy, you come a-hopping, you know. And so I, I said to Isaiah, anytime you feel froggy, you come a-hopping, you know. And he comes roaring over to me like he's going to tackle me. You know what I did? I tackled him, you know. Hashtag winning, you know. Got right up on top of him. And you know what I did then? I grabbed his arm and I twisted it behind his back, you know. I mean, 
not enough that it was going to break. He's laughing now. He wasn't laughing then. He says, you got to let me go. You got to let me go. And I said, you know what, you know what I say? I say, you got to say one thing. Uncle, uncle, I give up. I give up. It took God an awful lot to get Jonah to say, I'm done. I give up. Simple truth tonight, beloved. It ought not take us the same. We don't have to stay in the belly of the fish for three days when we know in Jonah's story that God's promise is the very moment that we turn, listen, he's right there with grace and he's got our landing spot picked out for us. Stand with me reverently and let's pray.